disclaimer, if you're uh, not comfortable being on camera, uh, just don't turn your video on. Uh, um, I don't know if, if Sahil and Ulrich, if you guys want uh, people to ask questions uh, during or after, um, but I'll, I'll let you guys decide. Um, yeah, they, they can totally ask questions. Uh, so since there are like two co-hosts, like while one of us is teaching or saying something, the other one can chime in and answer the questions in the chat. So if anybody has any questions, you should totally like type them in the chat. I don't know if there's a chat available. At least I can't see one. Um, there isn't? I can't. Um, so I don't know if you can change that setting. Um, People can just okay, jump in. Just make you a co-host and do you know like how to do it? Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I can try, um, but maybe, maybe we could just say that if someone, someone can just react, like raise their hand and then um, you can answer questions that way. Yeah, yeah. And then the last thing that I, I wanna say is that there will be a feedback survey for this workshop so that we can improve future workshops. Um, and I'll either send that via email or if we get the chat figured out, then I'll send that over the chat. Okay, yeah. Because I just got it like, and yeah, I think we'll be doing it like in the last five or 10 minutes, so, okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm excited. Let's get this going. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay, I'm just running into like a small issue. Just give me a, give me one minute. Okay, can you see this? Yep. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Um, now we can't. Oh, okay, one sec. Okay. So, 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 welcome everyone to this session on machine learning in Python. So, this is going to be a session of 
uh, four parts as as we had mentioned in the main. So this will contain uh, artificial neural networks, uh, convolutional neural networks, generative adversarial networks, and Bayesian optimization and hyperparameter tuning uh, in the last part. So, so in this part, we'll focus on more or less the basics of machine learning and the more more specifically like artificial neural network. So, so I am Sahil and Alric will be joining us for the later half. So, let's get into it. So. So artificial neural networks, like most machine learning algorithms, are um, bio-inspired algorithms. So they are essentially designed to replicate how a human brain processes data by using software. So this is an example of a neuron in our brain. And in our brain, we have like 100 billion of these neurons. So I think the most important part of a neuron is to uh, absorb the dendrites and the connections in which uh, they connect with one another. So, so when there are when there are like a large number of them, they uh, and they are trying to process any data. They essentially transmit uh, small electrical signals. Uh, which are transmitted based on some thresholds. So, which is very close to how uh, we are replicating uh, the models of neurons uh, in programs. So, in, in, uh, in reality, like uh, the activity between these neurons, the neural activity, the electrical impulses can easily be visualized by using MRIs and a lot of modern technologies work in these days. So, so the more we the more we increase our understanding on neurons, the better we can model uh, artificial intelligence models. So, the research in AI and uh, the understanding of brain like kind of go hand in hand. This is actually a physical uh, network of biological neurons um, at this point this is not really relevant to us but if we if we try to bring the overall structure of an artificial neural network uh, we can we can actually see the similarities between both of them so on the left we have uh, a biological network and on the right we have a synthetic network so at this point, I know that most of these things, like the the input layers and the hidden layers or the outputs, don't really make sense, or what these circles are and what these arrows mean. We'll will definitely be getting more into what they mean um, in the later parts of this session. But I think it's pretty cool at this point to mention how how similar both these structures actually look, uh, like both the biological network and so going back to the origins of ANNs, um, they are capable of learning extremely nonlinear phenomena. So like I said, uh, the whole goal of uh, artificial neural networks is to process data in a manner which is similar to how humans or like uh, mammals with brains process data. Uh, in the nature. So using ANNs, we can uh, learn these uh, relations or phenomena, which can be extremely normal. So the advantage of having something which can do this is that it's really applicable to a lot of the physical processes where data is mostly normal. So going back to research, uh, research dates all the way back to the 1940s, where McCulloch AL developed the calculus which was required to uh, understand the nervous activity in the brain, which is fundamental to later developing the neural network. So in the 1950s, J.Y. Letwin AL developed the uh, 
uh, research which can understand the uh, relationship between the electrical impulses from the frog's eyes to how they communicate with their brain. And in 1962, Hugo Leal proposed like the really popular uh, paper in which they try to understand the visual stimuli of cats. And finally, uh, in the late 1960s, Ivakshenko Eyal proposed uh, fundamental works on polynomial theory, self-organization of recognition, and self-organization of neural networks, which more or less forms the basis of modern machine learning and deep learning algorithms. So even today, a lot of uh, modern networks can can be seen to contain traces from their works. Uh, so these were actually originated in Russia, and some traces of it still exist uh, to this day. So I want to go into uh, not much into detail, but I want to go into the uh, intuition behind. A really cool theorem, which which kind of explains the wide range of applicability for artificial neural networks. So, so this is called as the universal approximation theorem, which exactly states what it does. So, there is a really this is the really precise mathematical formula or for a statement of this theorem. It was developed both by Sibenko and Hornick. Uh, almost simultaneously, but independent of one another in the 1980s. So essentially, it, it basically says that any continuous function of arbitrary complexity can be represented by an NN to any desired degree of accuracy. So if, so if we have a process and if we have like a ton of data, of this process evolving over time, uh, the universal approximation theorem basically says that we can train an ANN using this data to learn the underlying uh, process, which is governing this uh, underlying equation, which is governing this process. So as you can see, uh, in engineering, we have, we have uh, a lot of data and this is this finds the perfect uh, uh, application for for a lot of our needs. So, if we have, and it also says that we can train it to uh, any desired degree of accuracy. So, which it comes really into handy for solving a lot of problems in like fluids or like controls or any most nonlinear processes. So, yeah. Uh, now we'll we'll go into more uh, details on the structure of an ANN and how how we can train an ANN to learn more uh, about any nonlinear processes. And I'll I'll pass the stage to Alric if if he's ready. Um, hi. Just give me a sec, I'll just get my screen shared. Um, yep, and yeah, we're good to go. Do you, can you guys hear me? Yep. Uh, so cool, uh, let's get into uh, what neural nets are actually doing and how, they, how do they function. So, um, so basically, this is what a typical machine learning pipeline looks like. All right, okay, so there is this data pre-processing part. Um, data pre-processing consists of scaling your data, normalizing your data, and like converting RGB images to grayscale and the reverse. And the next thing you do is you take this pre-processed data and you train your model or you optimize your neural net model with it. And the last step is to evaluate your model to know how good it is, is it performing. So um, neural nets are used mainly for two uh, main purposes. The first purpose is as a classifier. And as you can see here that the neural net output a decision boundary 
given by these dotted lines classifies your data into two classes class red and class green and um, the neural so neural nets specialize in solving higher dimensional nonlinear problems which are very tough to solve using classical uh, methods and that that is the one reason why neural nets are so popular um, the second the second application of neural nets is regression and unlike classification where in you're trying to um, classify your data into different categories or classes you you try to predict the actual value of an entity for example if you want to perform temperature predictions or uh, position estimates for example you want to get the x y and theta coordinates in three dimensional space two dimensional spaces um, you use you use neural nets to perform regression there so so the question is how do we optimize and what do we mean by optimizing optimization in the ml you know ml world so in machine learning usually we want to either minimize a function or maximize it this is generally not the case uh, all the time for example like in gans uh, you want to find a saddle point and you don't want to either minimize or maximize a function but mostly in many in many in many um, scenarios you either want to minimize or maximize a function uh, let us look at a simple example of a parabola given by the equation y equals x minus 3 square plus 2 so the way we the way we would approach um finding the minima of this parabola is i would i would take the derivative of y with respect to x um given by y prime and that would be 2x minus 3 and i would equate that to 0 from this i can derive that the minima is given by the point 3 comma 2 um right but this was an example of a closed form solution um uh, by closed form i mean that the solution is very easily achievable but many times you will you will face this problem that your solutions are intractable or um there are no closed form solutions and in those cases we use something called as an optimization algorithm and one such optimization algorithm that is heavily used in the ml community is called um, gradient descent so basically what gradient descent is that your aim is to let let us assume there's a function f that you want to minimize you initialize you initialize your um your x's randomly um and you keep updating your x's given by this formula here till you do not converge by convergence we mean that you do not reach a good level of performance um for your f of x so as you can see that uh, one one important note to take here is if you want to if you want to minimize your f then you would want to move in the negative direction of the gradient so um this this is uh, this symbol here is states like this this means this is the gradient of f of x and um to minimize f of x you want to move in the negative direction of the gradient and similarly if i want i would want to maximize f of x i would move in the positive direction of the gradient so keeping this in mind let's let's do a simple example uh, we'll use the same parabola from before given by x minus 3 the whole square plus 2 right and let's start with a, a random point a little close to the minima p0 and p0 let's let's select p0 to be 2 comma 3 and a step uh, so i i just forgot to mention that this eta here is called a step and this is a parameter that we choose so let us choose eta to be 0.1 and uh, let us apply gradient descent to p0 and let's find p1 Uh, so this is nothing but p0 of x minus 2 times x minus 3 times eta uh, which comes out to be 2.2 and substituting 2.2 back in the parabola equation we get the point 2.2 comma 2.64 uh on on the graph here you can see that it's the blue point here and as as you've noticed that we are moving close closer to the minima again if we use p1 and to find p to x we we now get a little more closer to the minima and if we if we continue this maybe like 100 times we might actually reach very close to the minima and uh, th- that's that's basically a gradient descent um so the question so the important question here is uh in in artificial neural nets what do we want to maximize or minimize what is our function of interest right uh so there are two main approaches 
in uh, that the ml community usually follows um, the first is the likelihood function and the likelihood function is a measure of how well our model fits to the data uh, and the second is the loss function uh, which where the loss function is uh, a measure of how inaccurate our model is so both these um, thoughts or uh, both these uh, methods are correlated to each other so for example if you minimize the loss function you are actually maximizing your likelihood function and vice versa uh, but but in this session we we will go with some loss functions because they are more intuitive to think about and like um, uh, they 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 are more um, easy to solve right so let's first take look take a look at some loss functions um, so this is the l2 loss this is this is also known as a mean squared error or uh, or you can just imagine this to be like an l2 norm um here y are your labels and f star is your model predictions so so basically we are just taking the difference between them and the l2 norm the l1 loss is um nothing but the sum of the absolute difference between the labels and the predicted um model uh, model predictions the cross entropy loss is a pretty interesting um loss which is given by yi's and log of pi's where your y is your target probabilities and your pi's are given by model probabilities uh, so let's do a simple example and let us assume that we have a model that wants to uh, identify whether it's a photo of a cat or a dog right so so um so let's say let's say we get an image of a cat right so so uh, our y would look look like something like this right so it's a cat uh, and this is the label and let us assume that our model prediction was something like 0.7 and 0.3 these these are our model predictions so our model isn't perfect so um so so according to cross entropy loss um we just do a vector multiplication of this quantity and as you can see this just results into log of 0.7 um sorry the negative of log of 0.7 because of the negative sign and um this is basically the cross entropy loss just a, a rule of thumb is that usually l2 and l1 losses are used for regression and cross entropy loss is used for classification problems um so let now, now let's get into how a neural net actually functions right um so neural nets can be summed up as forward pass and backward pass um in the forward pass you move from your inputs to the outputs so so basically you're moving in this direction and the backward pass is literally the opposite in which you're moving from the outputs towards the inputs um and also this is known as our inputs right um and these h are known as hidden layers so generally uh, we have several hidden layers but here for like a simple simple understanding we're just taking one hidden layer consisting of h1 h2 h3 and this this p is our output so let's uh let's get into how do we derive how do we get the values of h1 h2 h3 and p's right so so as you can see x x1 is connected to h1 with the weight w1 and x2 is connected to h1 with the weight w2 so h1 is basically nothing but w1 x1 plus w2 x2 and we are feeding this to a function called phi so it's very important here to know that phi is a nonlinear function and these phi's are called as activation functions activation functions are a very important play a very important role in the learning of a neural net so um, so so uh, we'll come we'll we we'll get back to what happens if these fees do not exist or i mean if they if they are not there in this equation right so move, moving from h so similarly we find h1 h2 and h3 and um, in order to find our output p we we use the same we use the same logic we multiply v1 by h1 v2 by h2 and v3 by h3 uh and we get this final equation for uh, p 
so so just in case you guys didn't guess uh, didn't guess it already but w1 w2 and and v1 v2 v3 all of these are weights and and these are the parameters that we want to learn uh, in our neural net so now let's ask a question what the phi the function phi did not exist or it was a linear function so if it was a linear function uh, you would have something like this um, and in that case your h1 would just be the product of the weights with respect to the inputs similarly for h2 and h3 and your final p would come out to be something like x1 times a plus x2 times b so what does what this means that if there was no phi your entire neural net can be summed up as just two constants a and b so your hidden layers do not make any um, contribution to the neural nets at all and that's why these phi's or these activation functions are usually non linear in nature um, so let's take an let's take a look at some examples of these activation functions um, sigmoid logistic tan h relu and leaky relu these are the common types there are there are many more but relu is the one that's used the most uh, it uh, the, the the function is pretty simple the function is uh, given by f of x equals x when x is greater than or equal to 0 or it is 0 for x less than 0 and this simple non linearity is very popular uh, because it it just it just uh, leads to real good performance um, uh, in the in neural nets and it's it's kind of a it's kind of a mystery or uh, not really sure why it does so uh, but it's pretty popular and most of the ml community uses this activation function um so let's get to the second half of like uh, the neural nets uh, functioning and that's back propagation so now now what we did is we went forward and we calculated our output after we calculate our output uh, we compare it with the labels and we get the loss right now what we want to do is we want to update our weights so that we minimize our loss right and from the gradient descent algorithm previously we saw that uh, the the gradients the the weight update can be written in this format where um, del l del w is basically the gradient of l with respect to the respective weight so all, all you need to do is find these gradients in order to update your weights um so let's 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 do another simple example in which we take an l2 loss function uh, given by this uh, formula here the y is your true labels and f star are your model predictions right um so pre previously we 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 found out that p equals phi of p1 h1 plus v2 h2 plus v3 h3 so for simplicity let's just drop out this phi and let's just uh, consider p to be the product of these and this is this is basically this is just written in vector form so p is just x w times p and uh let's let's do a simple example of calculating some gradients and uh doing some weight updates so let us assume that we wanted to update v1 right so if you want to update v1 we need the gradients of the loss l with respect to v1 and in order to calculate that we use this common um technique in calculus called as chain rule so so what we want to do here is we want to express the the gradient of loss with respect to v1 in terms of known gradients right and so 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 the law the gradient of loss with respect to v1 can be expressed as gradient of p with respect to v1 and gradient of in times gradient of l with respect to uh, p right uh, this this comes from the chain rule and um, let let's calculate these values one by one uh and we know that del p by del v1 is h1 which is given by this equation here so if i just uh take the gradient of p with respect to v1 uh it it just leaves me h1 right so that the value is h1 and del by del p is given by this equation uh the the i mean this this term here and all we do is we just multiply these terms and that's a gradient with respect to v1 and uh so so we can successfully update uh v1 now because 
the only unknown parameter there was del del l uh, del l by del v1 and now we know that right uh, our step sizes are decided by us which is which are eta and um, let's do another example where we are moving a little bit towards the inputs so it's 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 obvious that as we move towards the inputs our chain rule becomes our chain rule uh, equation sizes just keep increasing and del l by del w2 in case we want to update w2 can be expressed as this uh, this equation and all these terms we can uh, again we can just derive them easily so this is given by just x2 which is pretty intuitive and um, the next thing is the del h1 by del w1 x1 plus w2 x2 now note that there we use an activation function so so let's let's just keep it as p prime for now and del p by del h1 again is given by v1 and this we calculated last time as well and uh, all we do is just take a product of these terms and now we have the gradient of the loss with respect to w2 um the the one good thing is that these days uh, you don't have to do these back propagations uh, when you are solving these problems like uh, using python or something like that because these ai frameworks like pytorch etc they do the back propagation for you they calculate gradients for you so you don't have to worry about that um, also in case you uh, want to get an actual feel of how the gradients are calculated um, i have attached a link in the references section um, in the end of this in, in the end of this presentation and feel free to take a look at how uh, these ai frameworks are actually calculating gradients it's it's basically they use this, they use the um, uh, the chain rule also but it's just it's just a little more organized there right um, so so this is the basic layout of how a neural network actually works there is a forward pass um, you 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 calculate the loss right and then the next step is once you get the loss you calculate all the gradients for all the weights right so um, in our case they were w1 to w3 and sorry w6 and v1 to v3 right so you calculate the gradients of all these weights and then the next thing you do is you you update your weights right um, since the only unknown from the gradient descent uh, algorithm were the gradients and now we have calculated them so we can easily uh, update our weights and then while we haven't converged or by converge here we mean that while a loss is still high or still big we keep repeating this process over and over again and we and we notice that a loss keeps decreasing and after some time the changes are very small and that's when you declare that okay we 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 feel like we have converged to a good loss value and that's when you stop uh, so this is basically how a neural net works and um, so uh, any questions at this point Yeah, uh, Alvik. Can you give an example of how you'd use forward pass, get loss, and uh, backward pass? You know, uh, in 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 a practical scenario, like instead of just using the equations, can you give me like a, a a basic example of how you'd take a you know simple you know an algorithm and then walk walk through it? Oh, okay. Uh, so so let's take an example. uh so uh, like something like the cat and dog thing that you mentioned before how you'd use that you know using these right, steps yeah. yeah so uh the reason i uh, so the reason i don't want to take that example because that's like a classification example that is a little more complicated and uh let's take like a temperature prediction example right so okay. uh let's let's assume that there are these temperature values um recorded throughout the day so so this is like per hour temperature so this is suppose like a 9 am temperature um uh, reading then there's a 10 am temperature reading and so on uh, up to like up to like some like every hour we are making a temperature reading right and um so suppose we have a temperature year of um, uh 70 degree fahrenheit and then 72 74 
75 and then here we, we, we want to predict the temperature of the the fifth fifth entry right so 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 what we do is uh, we have oh, okay um, maybe we can take another example let me think of it okay we, we let's 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 do this example itself so so what our input to our model will be the previous temperature and we want to predict the future temperature right so um, and then when we reach here we'll input this to our model and we'll predict the future temperature just just like that uh, so input in this case x would be 70 right we'll give it to uh, a neural net um, and it'll do a forward pass and it will generate a temperature let us let us call that temperature t right now what we want to do is we want to calculate the loss so let's let's use the same l2 loss that we used earlier and according to that uh, and let let, it, let t be maybe 73 right let 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 a model prediction have like p73 so we calculate the l2 loss which is given by y which is um, Y, which is our label, so our label is 72, right? Because this was supposed to be the actual temperature and our model predicted 73, right? And we'll calculate the loss here, which equals uh, 0.5. The loss equals 0.5. And what we then want to do is we want to do a back propagation, right? To find all the gradients, um, uh, back prop. And this we can do uh, using, using using um, these methods. So it, it really depends on the architecture of your model. So if your model was something like this, uh, then uh, then you would just just get the gradient of loss with respect to your, your final output. Um, um, so so, so let, let us consider a very simple example of your weight being just one parameter and your X being X being like an input, right? So your uh, your P would be equal to W times X, right? Your loss equals um, half times Y minus W X, the whole square. So you take the gradient with respect to P and, uh, and then you convert this gradient with respect to W, right? And that's how you get your grade. Um, then that then suppose your initial grade your weight was something like 0.1, then you update your weight of time step t plus one as 0.1 minus eta times the gradient with respect to w. Uh, is is this is this clear enough or is like uh, should I go in a little more depth? But we can definitely discuss this even at the end in case you still have a question of how I calculated it. But, uh, but is it, is, is this, does, does it make any, it make it any clearer? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted an overall picture. Thanks. Okay. Oh, got it. Cool. Uh, any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So the function for P we're defining as the input uh, V1, H1 plus V2, H2, yada, yada, as an input yeah. to the activation function. But when we're taking the gradient, it doesn't seem like we're taking it with respect to that activation function. We're just taking it as oh, a yeah. function of V1, H1, V2, H2, V3, H3. For so, example, so when we're I, doing partial, yeah. partial P. So actually, what uh, there was just a small change here. So as you can see here, there is no activation function in this part, right? Uh, I removed that activation function so that like the calculation could be easier. But yeah, uh, the, the earlier version did have a, uh, this, this earlier one did have an activation function here and we just, we just re removed it for like a simple uh, simplification. Okay, gotcha. Um, so I think, it, thank you for ex uh, explaining this. Uh, my question is, uh, when taking a d delta L delta P, um, you will end up with a term of the form delta Y delta P, where Y is your real data, um, and it's being and the term is the gradient of the real data with respect to a model parameter. 
Um, what it, what does that mean, and what should be done with that term? Oh, uh, could could you maybe repeat which term exactly are you talking about? So when you take the delta L delta P, yeah, um, simply applying the calculus to that, you will have a term of the form delta Y delta P um in the result of that oh uh do you do you, are, you, are you thinking about the chain rule like how does um so are, are you talking about the chain rule in the sense like how how do we convert w2 here and how do we get get rid of p or something like that well so i understand um how delta l delta w2 becomes okay. um the next set of functions but you still have delta l delta p now and in terms of practically solving for delta l delta p mm -hmm. um if you just do the, the math there's going to be a term that comes out that is delta y delta p in other words, the gradient of your actual data with respect to the parameter p. So this is the final expression that we will get, um, you know, uh, for the gradient of W two. So I, I don't I don't see a gradient a delta of y. Yeah. But why not? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, like the chain rule suggests that this should be the actual value of the gradient with respect to W2, of the loss with respect to W2. So, uh, because, Alex, I think uh, he's talking about if you see that equation next to P, right? Uh, del L by del P is equal to Y minus something, something. When you take that, uh, I think the derivative of that, you'd get a term del Y by del P. Oh, no. And he's no, like, that, where that, does that go? Oh no, sorry. So, so this is the value of the derivative. The question, but... uh, this is the value of the derivative. So remember our loss was um, half times y minus v x w v the whole square. So I've taken a derivative with respect to this term and then this is the value of the derivative. So I won't take the derivative of this with respect to p again. Th does that make it clear? But... I guess what I don't understand is why does it going from L to delta L delta P not produce a term delta Y delta P? Oh, okay. So, so um, I, I, I get, I get your point. So, uh, so you can, you can think of our data as like a constant here because um, our data are just randomly selected uh, points and um, yeah, they, they are not a function of your, you know, of your, uh, weights. Uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're trying to get at. It's like you, you're trying to make a connection between y and the inputs x. And so you're saying that uh, if there's a function existing between them, so the, so the derivative, so, so when you take the derivative with respect to del p, uh, you should get a, a del y by del p as well. But here you, you can actually assume that they are constant. They're like, yeah, they're, they're constants, yeah. Okay. Oh, got it, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I took so much time to understand the question. Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. No worries, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, so the, the, the links that I was talking about, if you want to take a deeper look into how uh, DL frameworks actually do that, you can take the look, take a look at these slides or even this video. Um, yeah, so I hope I was able to get you guys to at least get get you guys started on what a neural net or how a neural net actually works. And uh, let's let's kind of move on with the session. And I let Sahil take over again. Okay. Can you see this? 
Yes. Okay. Um, you guys went into more, way more into depth than we were hoping for. We thought a good intuition on how backpropagation works would be an excellent step for us to move forward. But it's great that you guys have like a much deeper understanding of how things happen. So now we'll. Uh, now that we know about the structure of the model and training using backpropagation, let's move on to how we can train the ANNs like more efficiently. So, so there are a few alternatives to executing backpropagation, and the most popular ones are using either evolutionary or swarm-based optimizations to update your weights, and you could also update your weights during training using mini batches of data. So typically you have learned that using backpropagation updates your weights after, after you pass each sample in your training data set. So if you have 100 instances in your training data, the weights are updated 100 times. So this is slow and sometimes can be inefficient. So instead you, you could calculate the average errors of say like 20 instances at a time and update update them only like five times through one epoch. So so the batch so the mini batch here referring to like the 20 instances and this surprisingly works much efficiently and since you only update like uh, a smaller number of times this is also like way faster than traditional uh, training. So now let's explore a common problem which is encountered in any artificial intelligence model called overfitting. So it can easily be understood by looking at these plots. So if we have some values on uh, y-axis, uh, which are literally titled values, and these values are evolving over time on the x-axis. In the first subplot, we can see that the trend line, uh, which we have developed, basically poorly captures the trend, which is followed by this data. So this is a linear trend, which is not able to capture the nonlinearity in, uh, in the process. If, if we keep training our artificial neural networks with, with this data, over time, after a couple of epochs, we we can basically form an estimation of the process, which which looks something like the second subplot. So here we can see that the trend line does a better job at trying to understand the underlying process. So this is a this is a precise fit of uh, how how well we can learn the process using an ANN. So this is this is a good spot to actually stop training our data. Too much training, the model can also lead to uh, unwanted uh, consequences, uh, which can be seen in the third subplot. So this is known as a model which has overfitted the data. So this is not only trying to capture the trend which is followed by these values over time, but it is essentially also trying to learn the specific noise associated with this data set so that it's basically reducing the error. So our end goal is not simply to reduce the error or the loss functions. It should also be trying to avoid overfitting uh, with this particular data set. So our training should be more or less uh, in a way generalized or independent of uh, the kind of data set which we use for a specific process. So there are like many ways in which we can reduce overfitting. And the most common thing is to do regularization to avoid overfitting. Uh, Regularization is essentially adding some kind of information to the loss function in order to uh, avoid overfitting. And it also helps with solving many ill post problems, which traditionally don't have a closed form solution. Um, notably, if you are working in fluids, uh, 
you know that there are many ill pros problems like the super resolution or uh, linearizing uh, a flow model. So one form of regularization is called as dropouts, where you randomly omit weights from training with a probability. So sorry about that. So during training, you you essentially choose to omit certain weights with certain probability. It's usually around zero point five. So in an epoch, you either choose to like update the weight or not, uh, based on arbitrarily uh, evaluating some probability. So this this form of regularization can be used to understand why the ReLU activation function is actually so popular. This 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 gives slight intuition behind why it works so well. Uh, the ReLU activation function. Uh, which which we have seen in uh, Alex part of the talk, uh, as he was mentioning, like it does pretty well uh, and it's very popular. This naturally executes dropout, so this naturally does regularization and avoids overfitting. This might be one of the reasons why it works so well miraculously. So if you are beginning uh, to build your model, it's always a good idea and a rule of thumb to begin with ReLU before moving on to other activation functions to see if they perform better. And the other form of act regularization is called early stopping, where you literally observe the errors and stop the training when you think the model is overfitting. And another way to optimize your neural network training is to do random shuffling while training to ensure not getting stuck at a local minimum. So what exactly do I mean by random shuffling is if you have a data set with five points of inputs and output, in the first step, you feed it like the first, uh, like the data points in the order of one, two, three, four, five in one cycle. And in the next step, you feed like two, three, four, five, one, and in the next three, five, one, two, four, or something like that. So so that you, you don't get essentially stuck at uh, a local minimum. And... I'm um, sorry, just one sec, sorry for interrupting. I think someone raised their hand, so uh, yeah, go ahead and ask a question if it was related. Okay. Oh, if it was me, then I had just forgotten to lower uh, it from earlier, sorry. Sorry, sorry, yeah, that's, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, it's totally fine. I, I can't really see the chat, so I don't think I can see if people raise their hand. So so please like hit me up if, if someone raises their hand. Okay, so now let's try to understand a few machine learning terminologies like uh, hyperparameters. Uh, basically, hyperparameters are features which define the structure of an ANN, such as the number of hidden layers and the number of neurons in each layer, the, the kind of activation function which we have in each neuron and so on. And we also have a learning rate which determines the step size at each iteration while moving forward towards the minima of the loss. There are, there are a bunch of hyperparameters uh, other than the, the ones which I have mentioned. And it is essential to find the optimal set of these hyperparameters before we move on to training the neural network. So to illustrate like why it is so hard to find the optimal set, we can, we can do a really small thought experiment by saying if we have 10 different uh, sets of hyperparameters and we wanted to find the optimal set, which which minimizes the error to the, to the highest extent. Uh, each, the training process usually takes a couple of hours if, if it's a smaller data set. So if we have like 10 different data set, 10 different uh, settings for hyperparameters, then we would have to wait like 10 times the training duration and then decide on the optimal set of hyperparameters. 
so as you can see like it, it can get uh, quite uh, lengthy or it can it can be very expensive to evaluate the optimal set of hyperparameters there are a lot of tricks and tricks to uh, efficiently identify the uh, best performing set of hyperparameters but but it's slightly out of scope for this session and the the fourth session of our uh, workshop series uh, specifically focuses on training and tuning the hyperparameters, including Bayesian optimization. So you guys should definitely attend that session. But I just want to lay the groundwork for why it's important. And okay, so before we move on, it's also important to bring some other machine learning terminology. Uh, the training, testing, and the validation data sets. So if you have any data set, you essentially divide it into these three parts, which are used to train and validate your model, or more precisely, the training data set is used to literally train the machine learning model, which, so this is, this includes all the steps which Alec has been talking so far, where we update the weights and we, we try to minimize the loss and so on. The validation data set, it's not used in training weights. However, it is used to check if the model is overfitting our specific data set. So this can be used in early stopping and to get an overall sense of how well the training is happening. And finally, we have the testing data. As a rule of thumb, uh, machine learning engineers tend to not include testing in any part of training or validation data, just to uh, get a completely uh, unbiased uh, opinion. But it is, it is quite common to use uh, or substitute the testing data for validation data to get a sense of, uh, to get a general sense of how well your model is being trained. And a common split ratio for our bigger data set is 80% of it goes to training the data and 10% goes to validation and testing. Okay, so artificial neural networks are quite uh, elementary and not much research uh, uses them like currently. So since they are like evolved and they had the basis of understanding many uh, complicated AI models, uh, but there are still a couple of papers which come every now and then where we can see artificial neural networks to solve uh, common engineering problems. This was actually one of my previous projects in which we used artificial neural networks to learn the Newman boundary conditions and solve the boundary value problem for flow over a flat plate. Using artificial neural networks produced results that were 10,000 times faster to converge than direct numerical simulations. So if you are interested in this kind of research, please go ahead and read this paper and reach out to me if you have any other inquiries. And again, recently, the paper on the left by Benjamin Erickson, who was a postdoc with Professor Steve Brunton, he has some interesting results in fluid reconstructions using artificial neural networks with uh, a lesser number of hidden layers. So they are called as shallow neural networks. He only has like two hidden layers, which are like 20 or 30 neurons. Uh, and in the work on the right, this is a crucial work. This is a very important paper for neural networks. This was written by Professor Pedros Comos Tacos and his collaborator. Essentially in this paper, he explains that Linear artificial neural networks are equivalent to proper orthogonal decomposition. And hence we can use artificial neural networks for all the things which we can, um, for, for which we tend to use uh, PODs or like model decomposition or things like that. So this opens a flood of opportunities for um, multi-scale phenomenon like turbulence or heat convection and so on. So 
we will be using keras to program artificial neural networks in the next session section but uh, in the upcoming part of the session and i think it's a it's an important it's a good time to bring up the other ai modules in python uh, the popular ones are other than keras like pytorch and tensorflow and scikit learn uh, a few others from scikit learn are actually phd's from udub so that's the cool one and there are like a bunch of other modules in python uh, using which you can just build your own and from scratch in a couple of minutes so i'm assuming that most of you who are attending this session has never worked with artificial intelligence but by the end of this session we which means in the next 20 or 25 minutes uh, each one of you would have like build your own nn and used it for classifying things or uh, to be more precise we'll we'll train an nn uh, together such that if we show it an image of an item of clothing it tells us what it is so if you give an image of a shirt it says that it's a shirt and so on and with minimal programming so so if you want to follow along uh, go ahead and type this link in your browser or i since we don't have a chat for me to copy this thing just google fashion mnist keras and click on the first one of the first links which start with uh, basic classification so a lot of the code snippets and data sets which which i will be using uh, will be directly from this link which is the official documentation for the keras package so in our in the example which we will be building uh, we will be using fashion mnist dataset so any artificial intelligence model basically works like this we have we have the model and we show it a million images of apples and inform it that these are all apples and then we show that we show a million more images of oranges and inform that they are all oranges in the training case and after the training is done if we present the model a new image of a fruit then it can say that it's 70% sure that it's an apple or 50% sure that it's an apple or so on based on how closely this new image resembles the millions of images of apples or oranges which we have shown the in in, in the training case so so more data leads to more accurate results if if the data is good so if it's noiseless and we have more data then it's a good idea so now we'll we'll use the fashion mnist dataset for an example and it comes inbuilt with the keras module so we don't have to download it from anywhere it has 70000 images of clothes which belong to 10 categories as alvik has explained with cats and dogs we will be using 10 categories now uh like they are essentially like t-shirts and trousers and pullovers and dresses coats sandals shirts sneakers bags and underwear so these are the 10 different categories and we have 70000 images of clothes of these categories so after we train the nn if we show a new article of clothing the nn model will tell us the probability with which this image belongs to each of these 10 categories and obviously the probabilities of all these 10 categories add up to 1 so going into the code snippets there are essentially four parts building compiling and training the model and finally making predictions using the trained model uh this is where we can take advantage of all the modern python libraries uh, it is really really simple to build the ann models so these four lines of code build your ann and let's see let's see more closely the first line says model is equal to tf dot keras dot sequential uh, it essentially means that they are importing the sequential uh, object from the tf dot keras library so this is the keyword which denotes that 
the sequential keyword denotes that it's an artificial neural network. And in the second line, we specify the shape of the input to the ANN. Here, our inputs are all images of 28 by 28 pixels. So we write that in the input shape argument. We basically say input shape is equal to 28 by 28. And the flatten essentially converts the 2D image into a one dimensional vector. In the next line, we can see that we have added a hidden layer and there are two key terms. One is 128 and the other one is activation is equal to ReLU. 128 essentially describes the number of neurons in your layer and activation is the activation function. And ReLU is the ReLU activation function, which we have been talking throughout this session. And finally, we have uh, tf.keras.layers.dense of 10. This 10 essentially means that we have 10 categories of things which we are trying to classify, and that's it. So this essentially builds a model with an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. So next, we try to compile this model by using these arguments. The first one is the kind of optimizer which we use. This is more technical to get into and requires a lot of time, but Adam is the adaptive movement estimation based optimization. It is a common way to move forward. Uh, it is a traditional way to uh, do things and, and next we specify the loss function. Here we are specifying tf.keras.loss dot sparse categorical cross entropy. This is uh, what Alec has been explaining in, in one of his examples called cross entropy. And finally, we'll use the accuracy as a metric. So everything is really simple when you use this pre-built model. So to train the model, you'll essentially say model.fit and you give it the train images and train labels and epochs. So train images are basically your inputs to the ANN and train labels are the outputs to the ANN. And you are saying that you want to train for 10 epochs. Finally, after, after so this training stage takes a, uh, takes a bit of time. And after you train your model, you essentially try to make use of your trained model and make some predictions using this model. So once you have your model, if which has been trained with all the weights optimized to uh, learn the essential relationship between the input images and the kind of category to which they belong. Uh, you essentially add one more layer to this uh, model to reduce. Uh, okay, before we move on to like uh, the first line in making predictions. So if you have a trained model and you give it a new image which has not been trained, it essentially produces in the outputs uh, a bunch of probabilities which explain the probability with which it belongs to each category. So if you add the tf.keras.layers.softmax, it essentially reduces the effort of looking at the class with the highest probability and it basically gives out the number with which uh, which has the highest probability. So if you had three classes and a probability of 0 0.9 and 0 0.05 and so on, then if you add the softmax layer, it essentially says that the output, the output says that the first uh, category has the most probability and it's likely that it is the output. So, and to literally predict your uh, input, you just say like predictions is equal to uh, probability model, which is what you have built in the previous time. And you just say predict and you give it the image uh, which you want to predict using your uh, model. So, okay. These are the differences which I used for uh, explaining the examples in engineering. I we wanted to like uh, let you guys into breakout rooms if you wanted to do these things, but I think we are running short on time. So if if anyone has like any questions or uh, 
uh, I think this would be a point where you can just open this link and try to play around with this. This link also has uh, a Google Colab link where you can, where you essentially have all the steps beginning from data processing to predicting the images. So it will be, I think you guys can more or less follow along like what's happening in this link. And if you guys have like any questions, if you are playing around with this code, we'll be there to like take your questions. So this is essentially the page which you'll be getting into. And I was more or less explaining the things from these snippets. And if you want to look at the whole workflow, you actually click on run in Google Colab. And it has a whole notebook where you can observe the workflow from beginning to the end. Everyone, I just wanted to let you know that I emailed you the feedback survey. Um, so if you have any time, either now or whenever you have time today, if you could fill that out, that'd be great. Is everybody like familiar with how to execute cells in uh, Jupyter Notebook? Or do you guys need need any of us to uh, go over them? Like if you have never worked with the Jupyter Notebook, just uh, raise your hand or say yes or any hints of life. I've got a question. Yes. For the uh, for accessing these links, are, will you guys be sharing these uh, slide decks or? Yeah. Um, is that how this is going to work, or like? Yeah, we'll be sending out the PPTs which Alric and I used, like in the next ten minutes or something. So you guys can totally check out the links in the PPT. Okay, great. Thanks. No problem. 